In the late 1800s, a geologist by the name of C. Hart Merriam was surveying the lands of the western United States. In a moment of inspiration, he noted that different distinct plant communities were found both as you travel north in latitude and up in elevation. Now this concept of life zones is still in use today. From the dry deserts, one can walk up in elevation into desert scrub. Walk higher and reach the foothills of the mountains. From here, montane forests of pines dominate. Higher up, a subalpine forest of primarily spruces and firs create the last treed vegetation type. Then, walk to the very top of a mountain or to the top of the globe, and you have the tundra. While the Arctic tundra is restricted to the poles where severe conditions make tree growth impossible, the alpine tundra can be found at any latitude on Earth. The elevation at which it is found is strongly determined by its location on the globe. Take Alaskan mountains, for instance. On one of our expeditions, we explored the alpine zone near Anchorage. The alpine tundra began around 3,500 feet. Even though it looks really nice, we're 5,000 feet up in Alaska, so that makes it pretty darn cool. Or take the tall volcanoes of Mexico. We sent Joseph and Jonas up the third highest mountain in North America, Pico de Orizaba. They found the last trees at 13,500 feet. Up here, it's about 13,000 feet approximately, and we're going to be pretty much done with the trees in about another quarter mile, half mile or so. Heck, alpine zones are even found in places like Mauna Loa and Haleakala in Hawaii, where the tops of the mountains have only a few specialized plants that make this habitat their home. Here, tree line is around 9,000 feet. In Colorado, tree line is 11,500 feet. We traveled here to examine the alpine habitat in closer detail. Hey, we'll be the first to tell you that the alpine zone is not an easy place to be. For humans or anything else. The UV radiation, for instance, is twice as much at this elevation. The air is on average 30 degrees cooler than just at the bottom of the mountain. And the winds are high and storms can build when you're least expecting it. Right, it's starting to hail. But what does live here is specially adapted to this environment. The plants that live here form the basis of a relatively simple ecosystem. Most plants here are perennials. For example, this plant was here last year and will probably be here again next year too. The growing season is just too short and unpredictable for plants to start from a seedling, grow stems and leaves, and then produce flowers. Instead, one plant may take four or five years before it actually flowers. So heat up here is also limiting. Some plants have anthocyanins, pigments in the plant that make it red or blue. <clears throat> these pigments actually convert sunlight to heat. Look at other plants and you'll see tiny hairs on the surface. These hairs help trap the heat while also dissipating the harmful sunlight. Also, there are no tall plants here. Instead, they are low to the ground, like lichens and mosses, which helps protect them from the desiccating action of the wind. Do you ever wonder what pollinates these flowers? Well, it's not the bees, if that's what you're thinking. Well, instead, it's actually the more erratic and slightly less dependable flies. Bees just don't do so well up here. Plants are food for animals that live in the tundra. However, there just aren't that many animals that are found here. Large animals like mountain goats, bears, and elk can migrate here in the summer to feed. Only a few make this their home year-round. Ptarmigans are the only birds, and marmots and pikas are the most common year-round residents. The yellow-bellied marmot is the largest squirrel in North America. In the alpine tundra, you'll notice it scampering around for food among the rocks. They must watch out for birds of prey. They warn each other with high-pitched whistles. It has to stay busy, though, because they hibernate for eight months a year. A smaller resident is the pika. They look like rodents, but in reality, they're more closely related to rabbits. Like other animals of the tundra, they have reduced appendages. They have smaller ears, smaller legs, and shorter tails, all which help them reduce heat loss and survive in this harsh environment. So you've probably heard that the tundra here is a fragile environment. That makes a lot of sense if you remember that each one of these plants takes a long time to develop. One plant may take four or five years before it actually flowers. A disturbance here from humans could take up to 500 years to regrow to its original state. That means we have to be careful when we're here. When we explore a zone, we make sure we stick to trails, or when we get off, we hop from rock to rock. It's super important not to leave any trash. 
This small piece of paper could cover and kill a plant that may be decades old in only a few weeks. Also, we rely on snowmelt from the tundra to water our agricultural fields and stabilize the flow of our rivers throughout the summer. It's also a great place to learn about the interactions of plants and animals because of the simplicity of the food web. But we're going to leave finding out the details to you. For more information, log on to thewildclassroom.com backslash biomes. Ant hill, ant hill, ant hill. Aye, 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 I sat right on it. <laughs>